evening. I hope that you're having a good week, I trust. And uh, we are going to be studying tonight uh, more of the Gospels. This uh, is the feeding of the 4,000, um, not the feeding of the 5,000. And But we will be uh, discussing uh, those matters tonight and hopefully uh, learn something in the process. Um, the hope, of course, is that God will be glorified in all that we do. Uh, as you are saying hi or signing on, use the comments section. Um, I encourage that at least for a greeting or you can, if you're you know shy, you can just like the video or share it. it that would be nice if you were to share it and other people then would get a chance to see it. Um, uh, the other thing would be that uh, if you have a question regarding the Bible study, I encourage you to use the comment section to ask questions. Uh, and if I see it, I will answer it in real time. But if you're watching this after the fact and it's not currently live, why still ask a question if you would like and I will answer it. I just won't be able to do it in real time if we're not live. That's all. That's the only difference. So in the meantime, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer together, and then we'll get started, okay? Our Father in heaven, we come before you, and we ask, Lord, that you would do us a great miracle tonight. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear, we ask. Open our eyes, Lord. Open our ears, Lord. Help us, Lord, to see and to hear with the spirit that you did give us, rather instead, Lord, of with the flesh that Adam did leave behind for us. Help us, Lord, to escape, I pray, those things which beset us so easily because we don't even know or recognize sinful attitudes and sinful tendencies within our own flesh, for we have always lived with this flesh. And so often we have credited outside forces with either inspiring or causing or uh, even in some cases uh, orchestrating sin. But God, it is not the outside forces that are the more heinous. It is the inside that which we cannot see. For it is the, indeed, Lord, the moat, or rather the log in our own eye rather than the speck or the moat in a brother's eye. We need to be concerned, Lord, with that which the Bible tells us is our own understanding and tells us not to lean on it, that which is our own flesh, which the Bible tells us not to depend on or we would be under a curse. So we come before you, Lord, to seek your face, to ask, Lord, that you would indeed look upon us with grace and mercy, knowing, Lord, that we are nothing but flesh, Without you, Lord, we are even nothing. But, Lord, we love you. We trust you. Everything, Lord, you have said about yourself is true. So help us then, I pray, to walk according to that truth. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Um, good to see Daryl and good to see Sher Shirley and Tim. And um, we look forward to the study tonight. Uh, we are on question number four, which is on the back side of the most recent of the uh, study guides. And uh, we're going to read uh, the uh, account, I believe, in Matthew. And um, the account, the same account is there in Mark in verses 1 through 10. So... Um, Let's go to Matthew chapter 15, though, uh, verses 29 to 39. Matthew 15, verses 29 to 39. And Jesus departed from thence and came nigh unto the Sea of Galilee, <clears throat> and went up into a mountain, and 
sat down there. And great multitudes came unto him, having with them those that were lame, blind, deaf, or mute, or come on, eyes, uh, dumb, I think is the word that I was reading, maimed, and many others, and cast them down at Jesus' feet, and he healed them. Insomuch that the multitude wondered when they saw the dumb to speak, the maimed to be whole, the lame to walk, and the blind to see, that they glorified the God of Israel. Then Jesus called his disciples unto him and said, I have compassion on the multitude because they continue with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And I will not send them away fasting lest they faint on the way. And his disciples say unto him, Whence should we have so much bread in the wilderness as to fill so great a multitude? And Jesus saith unto them, How many loaves have ye? And they said, Seven, and a few little fishes. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven loaves and the fishes and gave thanks and brake them and gave to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. And they did eat and were filled. And they took up of the broken meat that uh, was left seven baskets full and they did eat and yeah and they that did eat were four thousand men besides women and children <clears throat> and he went away uh, and he sent away the multitude and took ship and came to the coasts of Magdala okay well Here's the story of the feeding of the 4,000. It sounds mysteriously similar to the feeding of the 5,000. There are real differences, though, between these two stories. Among those differences, the amount of food, uh, five loaves and two fishes specifically, and now it is seven loaves and a few small fish. Um, we don't know how much a few is, and we know seven loaves, though, it's seven. So there's a distinct difference there. Uh, the placing, he's up in the mountains at the feeding of the 4,000, the feeding of the 5,000, he was in a grassy plain. So the locations are different. Um, he's, he is uh, in the coastal region of Galilee, but he's on the opposite side of the Galilee from where the 5,000 occurred. 5,000 story happened in Bethsaida. The 4,000 happened over on the other side uh, of Galilee. So locations are different. The amount of food is different. And the, um, the setting is different. The reason is different. These, this multitude of 4,000 built up because they were bringing the lame and the sick and, and uh, the dumb and probably the deaf and the blind too. But for some reason, my eyes were playing tricks on me while I was trying to read. And I was trying to, uh, uh, trying to somehow uh, salvage the rhythm of my reading by assuming words that weren't there. Yet, I'm sure that there were blind and deaf there too. And probably those that were possessed with demons, although they're not specifically mentioned either. Um, when the feeding of the 5,000 occurred, that was right after the first missionary journey. Miracles had been done by the disciples. Those people followed the disciples out of those cities and followed them over to Jesus. Jesus then got in the boat. They were trying to get away to pray 
and to be in a quiet place on their own. And instead, the people came and Jesus sat down and taught them. Okay, now, in this particular case, I'm sure there was teaching going on with the 4,000 too. There may as well may have been some healings that went on with the 5,000. But the primary, uh, the primary motivation for the feeding of the 5,000 was as a result of them staying so long to hear the teachings of Christ. Whereas with the 4,000, it was them staying so long because of the great need that they had uh, for healings and for, and, and for the tending of the various maladies that the people had. Um, again, teaching probably happened with the 4,000, sure. Um, and healing probably happened with the 5,000, sure. But, but the 5,000 had its primary motivation and the 4,000 had its primary motivation. So there was also some difference there as well. Um, the, uh, the story of the 5,000 has greater detail in the book of John. But John doesn't even cover the feeding of the 4,000, nor does Luke. Uh, just Matthew and Mark. They're the only ones that cover it. Um, the feeding of the 4,000, uh, Jesus proceeds almost identically in both cases. In both cases, he announces that he has compassion on the group. He announces that they're too far away from any city. He doesn't want to send them away without any food because he's afraid they're going to faint along the way. So then he turns to the disciples in both cases and says, you know, you feed them. And uh, you would think that after the feeding of the 5,000, since this really isn't too long afterwards, you would think that the disciples would have realized something was up, but they seem to answer in almost the same way that they did before, you know, which before they had said, uh, well, you know, even if we had a whole day's wage on us, we couldn't feed all this crowd. But that was the 5,000. And then here in the 4,000, it's just like, with what? We don't have any food except a seven loaves and a few small fishes. And so Jesus said, okay, yeah, bring that over here and... and you would think that the disciples would have realized at this point. Now, the feeding of the 5,000, when you follow that up, the result of that is a group of people that are trying to follow Christ and they want to make him king uh, because they're thinking to themselves that they would be able to, to uh, extract from him the kind of miracles that would make it possible for them to not have to labor for their food anymore. And um, he tells them straight out, I tell you the truth, you didn't come to seek me because of what you were being taught, but because your stomachs were fed. And uh, then Jesus began to talk about real flesh and real uh, drink and talked about his, his flesh and his blood. And if you recall why a whole bunch of people left him at that point. Um, now this group of 4,000 men uh, besides women and children, which puts the crowd somewhere in the neighborhood of 16,000, probably. Um, this crowd is a, is a fresh crowd of, of people. Uh, it may be, may be some of the people that had walked away that came back just because they, they regretted having left because they realized that they were missing out on the experience of seeing Jesus. But... But uh, this is, relatively speaking, a completely different crowd because at the end of the, the uh, feeding of the 5,000, uh, Jesus introduced a teaching that was so hard that they couldn't handle it and they walked off. Um, and the Bible says that many of them just stopped following him after that. Um, so this crowd of 4,000 men plus women and children probably is, a, is mostly a fresh group of people. Um, now, do they follow him, you know, to the end? No. Um, the, in the end, we really only see about 120 people, uh, in the upper room. And that's, of course, in the book of Acts chapter one and two. And, uh, so there are some real differences between the feeding of the 4,000 and the feeding of the 5,000. And um, differences, I think, that need to be noted, mostly because there are those that uh, 
Some may be just because they're lazy in their Bible reading. Others because uh, they just want to find anything that looks like there may be a mistake in the scripture. And they see this and they say, well, it's the exact same story, just repeated. And a few of the details <laughs> changed, but it's not. It's completely different. And uh, therefore, uh, we hold the feeding of the 4,000 and 5,000 to be separate stories because they're presented as separate stories. Um, picking up now, uh, chapter 16 and verses 1 to 4 of Matthew. Chapter 16, verses 1 to 4. The Pharisees also, with the Sadducees, came and tempting desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. And he answered and said unto them, When it is evening, ye say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and um, lowering. <coughs> o ye hypocrites, ye can discern the face of the sky, but can ye not discern the sign of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall be no sign given unto it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. And he left them and departed. Now, here is a couple of interesting things. For one thing, the Sadducees. Um, if you don't know this, the Pharisees are... Uh, the, okay, Daryl left me a bunch of stars. I don't know why. <laughs> um, anyways, uh, the Pharisees are the conservative movement. Uh, they they hold to the scripture. They hold to tradition. Uh, they they believe that um, they they believe that uh, the scriptures hold the the truth. They believe in the resurrection. Um, the Sadducees, on the other hand, they don't believe in the scripture. They, they believe that the Torah is important, but beyond that, they don't believe anything else is all that important. And because of that, why the, uh, the Sadducees are almost never in the mix. Whenever Jesus is addressing people, you'll see that it says usually the scribes and the Pharisees. Very rarely does it say anything about the Sadducees. In fact, the Sadducees really don't even come to play into play until Jesus is, uh, you know, in these last six months around Jerusalem. Um, the Sadducees are the liberals, and Jesus doesn't even bother with them. Uh, that's that's something I think to take note of, because Jesus himself had said. Uh, don't don't cast your pearls before swine or give what is sacred to the dogs. And I think that what he meant there is simply what he said. Uh, there is no use to give to pigs pearls of wisdom that came from God because they, they're just going to trample them under feet and tear and rend you. And to give those things that are sacred, that came from God, that are important between God and his people, and to hand them over to the dogs, it's the same result. The dogs will tear them up and then turn and rend the one that delivered the message. Jesus doesn't waste his time with the Sadducees. And you say, well, why would you say that it would be a waste of time? Because it would be a waste of time. The scripture is clear about the disposition of some people. And the disposition of some people is that they are so rebellious that they just won't hear. They don't have eyes to see and they don't have ears to hear. And if God would give them eyes to see and ears to hear, then they would be able to. It's not to say that somewhere along the line a Sadducee maybe didn't become a believer later on. 
But as far as the amount of time that Christ had to bring the gospel to the people, to explain the Old Testament to the people so that they would understand what the gospel is, uh, he didn't have time to waste uh, trying to overcome the many objections that he would have faced with the Sadducees. So here, though, we see the Pharisees and Sadducees together, working together, which uh, is very strange. It would be like having uh, Joe Biden and, and uh, Donald Trump uh, walking up arm in arm to have a conversation with you about some important issue. You would be wondering, how is it the two of these fellows who are so diametrically opposed to each other have become friends? Uh, the answer would be that the enemy of my friend is my enemy, or something like that. What is it? The enemy of my enemy is my friend. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. Thank you. Uh, that's the one that I meant. Anyways, so, so uh, if your gospel happened to be the enemy of both the conservatives and of the liberals, <clears throat> why then you would see them palling together to come before you and to try and trip you up, even as we see that happening here with Jesus. They're coming to trip him up. Uh, they want to try and catch him in a fault. And so they bring up this idea of a sign. And Jesus' response uh, it kind of surprises me a little um, because instead of him saying, you know, what are you guys, morons? You haven't seen all of the stuff that I've been doing? You're, you're asking for more of a sign? You know, that, that would be my expectation. <coughs> if, if it was anybody like me, I would be like, what do you mean you want a sign? weirdos <laughs> but uh, Jesus wasn't as as uh, I would have been I suppose uh, he saw the opportunity rather to uh, tell this group of people that uh, no sign will be given to a wicked and adulterous generation that if they wanted a sign they needed to look into the scripture and study the sign of Jonah who was in the whale's belly for three days and afterwards was delivered back to life again. Of course, he's referring to his burial and resurrection that was coming at this particular time. And uh, that's the sign that he said would be given to it. Of course, they didn't believe it. They didn't seek after it. They had no interest in what he was saying, none at all. And so they dismissed it. Uh, if we look in this, into the story of Jonah, the story of Jonah itself is a sign. The prophet did not want to uh, warn the uh, city of Nineveh about God's judgment. We find later that the motivation for not wanting to was because he was sure that the only reason God was sending him to warn them was that God had in mind to, uh, to forgive them and to be gracious to them. And he didn't want that because he hated Nineveh because Jonah was a prophet from the northern kingdom and uh, Assyria, uh, which Nineveh was the capital of, had taken over uh, Israel, the northern kingdom, and Jonah was not wanting any part of that. Now this great fish spits him up on the beach after he's in the belly of the whale for three days. Now as he's in this belly of the whale, he prays, and there's a whole prayer that is uh, situated there in the, uh, in the book of Jonah. And in this prayer, he seeks out the Lord. He seeks out the Lord's will. And the Lord gives him a second chance. And uh, he's delivered back to life, as it were, uh, from certain death. And goes to Nineveh, warns Nineveh, 
and Nineveh does repent. And uh, then Jonah, we end with Jonah being angry with God for having forgiven Assyria, for having forgiven Nineveh, the capital. And uh, that's kind of where we end Jonah. He's just very grumpy about it. Um, God's final words to Jonah was, don't I have a right to do with Nineveh as I choose, that if I want to forgive it, I can forgive it. And if I wanted to make it wither, like I did the vine that you were enjoying the shade of, I could do that too. Um, the argument of, of the uh, book of Jonah in the end becomes that God has the right to do what God wants to do. And God will accomplish all that he is uh, set forth to accomplish, which is in keeping with Isaiah 46. And so, so he forgives Nineveh, and Nineveh is saved. Uh, in the case of Jerusalem, why Jerusalem is warned, and Jesus is killed, he's buried for three days, raises from the dead, but is Jerusalem saved? In this particular case, no, it's not. Um, it is given some time, but then it is taken over and sacked by the Romans in 70 AD. Um, in the same way, Nineveh repented at first, uh, but later in Nahum, we see Nineveh uh, being wiped out as a a capital and then the uh, movement of empires moves from there to Babylon so uh, we are looking at Matthew 16 verses 5 through 12 next and when his disciples were come to the other side they had forgotten to take bread then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have taken no bread. And when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O oh, ye of little faith, why reason ye among yourselves? Because ye have brought no bread. Do you not understand that neither uh, let's see do you not understand neither remember the five loaves of the five thousand and how many baskets ye took up, neither the seven loaves of the four thousand and how many baskets ye took up? How is it that you do not understand that I uh, spake it not to you concerning bread that ye should beware the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And then they answered, uh, they, then they understood how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Uh, is this to 16? Is that right? 12. Just to 12, okay. So that's where we are. We ended right on the spot. Okay. So what is meant here by uh, yeast? Uh, in the King James 11 and the NIV yeast, What's meant here by yeast? Well, here, yeast is specifically referring to the doctrine of the scribes and the Pharisees. And what is the doctrine of the scribes and the Pharisees? Well, the doctrine of the scribes and the Pharisees is that uh, they gain eternal life through the law. Now, primarily, however, uh, the thing that they are looking for before they look for anything else is whether or not a man has been marked with circumcision. 
that's the primary concern. If a man has been marked with circumcision, then that is the, in their minds at least, the guarantee that they are under the law, and if they are under the law, then they are saved. Uh, that is, that they are in right relationship to God because they have a mark on the outer part of their body in the personal area of a man. Uh, further beyond that uh, is the requirement to keep the law because circumcision is uh, basically a sign that you've come under the law. So now that you've come under the law, you're responsible to keep the law. And uh, Paul uh, refers to this in Galatians in chapter 3 when he says that anybody uh, who obeys part of the law is obligated to obey the whole law because the Bible says, Cursed is everyone that continues not to do everything written in the books of the law. So, so that uh, the, the uh, repentant person who is trying to seal that repentance with works uh, finds himself actually foiled. Um, this is why that yeast, this doctrine, works itself through the batch so quickly. And that is because uh, it is the desire of every human being to find some way to redeem himself. Uh, every human being that, that uh, believes there's somebody that's willing to believe in them again uh, will uh, make every effort to show themselves to be redeemable or worth redeeming. And this is, of course, the same uh, vulnerability that you and I are in. Uh, that is, that if somebody comes to you and says to you, all you need to do is obey this law and that law and the other law, and, oh, here's a mark that you need to put on your body as a, as a sign of your fidelity with God, um, when I was a kid in the 1980s, uh, a lot of my friends that were being saved at college uh, were wanting to put an earring in their right ear. This is my right ear uh, as I look at you. Now, why? Because the scripture had talked about that if somebody was to be an indentured servant, then they were to be pierced in the right ear and a ring was to be placed in that right ear to show that they belonged to their master permanently as an indentured servant. And so there were those that were wanting to have this outward expression that they belonged to or were indentured to uh, God and uh, wanted to have an earring, some kind of an outward sign to others that they belong to God, a reminder to themselves. Um, however, the scripture is not interested in that. Uh, the scripture, on the other hand, says that we need to circumcise our hearts. Now, it's interesting, and I've, I pointed this out before, maybe here, but uh, certainly in other Bible studies. In Deuteronomy 4, God says to the people, circumcise your hearts therefore now he puts the burden on the people to circumcise their hearts but then after he goes all the way through deuteronomy to demonstrate to them that that in all the, their attempts at their works they've been stiff-necked stubborn and rebellious god then says in deuteronomy 30 which is almost to the end of De the book of deuteronomy he says in Deuteronomy 30, he says, I, the Lord, will circumcise your heart. So, they're urged in chapter 4 to do the work themselves. And then chapter 30, after he has shown them how impossible it is that they would ever circumcise their own hearts, he steps in and he says, I'll circumcise your heart. So, here we have in one, ch in one book, 
we have the righteous command at the beginning and the fact that it's God that needs to do the work himself at the end. Uh, but in between is the reason why the doctrine of works does not uh, actually work. And the doctrine of works, which is the work of the scribes and the Pharisees here, the Pharisees and Sadducees, um, this doctrine of works is the doctrine that Jesus warns works itself quickly through the whole batch. Because what this does is it perks people up and makes them believe I can do something to save myself. I can do something to get myself into heaven. I can, I can satisfy uh, this or that requirement of God and by doing so, I can qualify myself for heaven and I don't need to be qualified in any other way. Because the only qualification you and I ever really count on is the qualification of our own selves. Uh, you know, we get into races and we qualify for the race. Uh, we get into jobs and we qualify ourselves for the jobs. Uh, we get into, uh, in, into uh, ventures, business ventures and such, and we have to qualify ourselves for that. We have to qualify ourselves to buy a house. Uh, we have to show that we are able to buy the house by putting down earnest money or a down payment on the house. Uh, qualifying ourselves is the way that we do things because people are looking for qualified people to do business with or to hold relationships with. And because of that, why uh, very often what happens is that Christians uh, fall into wrong thinking or sometimes wrong teaching that tells them that there is a way for them to qualify themselves for eternal life. Uh, sometimes that qualification comes before salvation. In other words, a qualification to be saved. Sometimes that qualification comes in the form of, how, of after you're saved, how to stay qualified. And, and uh, in both cases, these doctrines of works, whether works affecting your salvation or works affecting your sanctification, uh, those works in both cases, that is a doctrine that moves quickly through a church and quickly through a people because it is accepted. It is the doctrine they want to hear. It's the doctrine they want to believe uh, that they can either uh, be saved by qualifying themselves or that they can maintain their salvation through qualifying themselves. But instead, what the scripture tells us is that it's the work of God and uh, it's, it's his gift to us, salvation, uh, so that no one can boast. And then sanctification, that is what we see in uh, Titus chapter 2, verses 11 to 14. That is the grace of God that has now appeared unto men that teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passion. But it's, a, it's an educational process, it's a teaching process, um, but it is God in the end that actually sanctifies us. He's the one that heats us up like gold in the fire. He's the one that, that uh, brings on the crises in our lives so that we will be sanctified even more to him. Uh, he is the one that disciplines us. He is the one that, that brings us from where we are to where we are going and continues to build himself into us until he has built into us uh, a more Christ-like behavior, a more Christ-like pattern. And um, these kinds of things are the differences between uh, two kinds of theology. The one kind of theology works basically says that the will of man is not fallen and that man by his own will and by his own determination and discipline can make it into heaven and can please God and, and make all of that uh, occur. The other one says that man is fallen 
and his will is even fallen to the point at which even with good instructions and good qualifications, he will still never, ever make the decision to fully repent. He will compromise and he will bring God down in his mind and in his heart and he would rather make a God out of uh, iron or, or clay or stone or make a God up with his own ideas or his own, his own uh, reinterpretation of who God is than he would uh, be able to cross through the holiness of God and become himself holy. He, you, you can't. You know, we used to sing a song when I was a kid, you know, about uh, this wall that was so wide you couldn't get around it, so high you couldn't get over it, so low you couldn't get under it. You had to go through it the door. And uh, that song is, is still true to this day. There is no way for you to get from where you were born in Adam to where, where God requires you, which is holiness. The Bible says, without holiness, no man will see the Lord. So you have to become holy. You can't become holy. So how do you become holy? Well, it's through the grace of God and the grace of God only, which is why this yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees is such a warning from, from Jesus. Now this comes, of course, after they ask for a sign. What they are wanting is for Christ to qualify himself through a sign. But Christ declares that he's not going to qualify himself, that God it is that has qualified him. He doesn't need to qualify himself. And so he says, if you want to know whether I'm qualified, here's your sign. Your sign is the sign of Jonah. Look what God did to Jonah back in history, and that's exactly what he's going to do now. And so uh, we have then this question of the East perhaps answered. And again, if you have questions about it, you need some clarification, always be free to ask me a question. Um, what is Jesus illustrating by reminding the apostles of the number of baskets in each case. This is interesting. Now, there's no clear teaching on this, to be honest with you right now. Okay? Uh, the numbers themselves have significance in the scripture. And so we can, uh, we can at least deduce what this means. Now, 12 baskets, whenever we see the number 12, this is some reference, uh, usually, to the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 sons of, of Jacob. And so with the 5,000, they pick up 12 baskets full. Now there's 12 apostles as well. Why 12 apostles? Well, because there's 12 tribes. Jesus says to the apostles at one point that they will sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And so the 12 apostles, uh, that would be the 11 minus Judas plus Paul. The 12 apostles uh, will sit one day on thrones. Okay, now that having been said, uh, we look at these 12 baskets full and we ask ourselves, well, now what is this trying to say? Well, first of all, uh, the fact that there's more food at the end than what we started with shows something of the fruit of the nation of Israel, that the nation of Israel is starting small and ends big. That could possibly be what is being shown here. Uh, that uh, Israel will be fed and there will still be more left over for the future. Maybe that's what's being said. The seven baskets, uh, the number seven represents completion. 
the completed work of God. That uh, they had seven loaves, a few small fishes. That uh, there is something here in the 4,000 that God is trying to communicate something about completeness. Uh, trying to communicate something about how completely fed the church will be. Now, obviously the 5,000 with the 12 represents the nation of Israel. But the other represents uh, the uh, church in general. And Jesus expects the disciples to at least recognize the numbers. Because he says, how many baskets did you have left? How many baskets did you have left over here? And uh, so the numbers he expects are going to give them some clue. Again, there is not enough scripture to explain to us satisfactorily what Jesus is driving at here. There's enough scripture that we know that 12 has something to do with the nation of Israel. And that seven has something to do with completeness or with uh, the, the completeness of, of the work of Christ. So um, we will deduce whatever it is we want to deduce, but it's going to have to be within the category of the nation of Israel in the 12, where the 12 baskets full are left and in the category of completeness where the seven basketfuls are left. Now, beyond that is speculation, and beyond uh, scripture, where speculation dwells, uh, we don't want to teach that as absolute or as certain as we teach uh, what the scripture has to say uh, with regards to uh, its own self, where we have scripture in the Old Testament that validates and explains the scripture in the New Testament or scripture in the New Testament that validates and explains that which is in the Old. Um, that's where we find our confidence in the teaching. So we're not really sure what is going on here, uh, but it is, some, it is to say that uh, when, the, when the, the work of God is complete in Israel, that there will still be enough left over for each tribe and that when the work of God is complete among the church uh, that it will be fully completed. Um, other than that we're not really certain if there's much deeper meaning at all to this um, but this is this is the best that that we can ascertain from so few uh, passages regarding it. Now there may be some uh, commentaries out there are some commentators that feel that they have figured this out or unraveled this mystery um, I would I would certainly entertain their uh, viewpoint and think about it and ponder it because I know that there's no there's nothing clear here that I see um, but perhaps there are those more learned than me that have discovered something I have not yet discovered myself um, this brings us to uh, the end of what we have available to us as far as the, uh, the uh, study guides that I have posted. But I'm going to press on into the next study guide, uh, which is going to uh, start up with the blind men at Bethsaida, which is only recorded in Mark. So um, while you may not have this study guide available to you, I will post it and you can take care of it at that point. Uh, but for now, uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, pick it up anyway. And I'll read the question to you and then you can write it down on the back of the study guide that you already have unless uh, you don't actually use the study guides and you just kind of go along anyways. But um, we're going to start with uh, number one, which says the blind men at Bethsaida. Uh, remember that Bethsaida is the town where uh, Andrew and Peter are from. Mark chapter 8, verses 22 through 26. So I'm going to go to Mark chapter 8 
and then verses 22 through 26. And he cometh to Bethsaida, and they bring a blind man unto him, and besought him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand, and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes, and put his hands upon him, he asked if he saw aught. And he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. After that, he put his hands again upon his eyes and made him look up. And he was restored and saw every man clearly. And he sent him away to his house, saying, Neither go into the town nor tell it to any in the town. Now, uh, this blind man, uh, question one, uh, blind men, Bethsaida, Mark 8, 22 to 26, and then A is why the spittle and salve? Uh, well, he spits and then he puts his hands on the gentleman's eyes. Later, then he spits, or he puts his, his hands on the gentleman's eyes again. Doesn't spit the second time. Um, I think the NIV says something about making some salve and putting it on his eyes. Uh, the, uh, the question is, why does he do this? Uh, we don't know. We know this much, that whatever Jesus does, he does it out of obedience to the Father. That much we know. Uh, he was replete about that in John chapter 7 through 10. And um, he constantly said through there, I only do what the Father tells me to do. I only do what I see in the presence of my Father. I don't speak on my own behalf, but, the, but I speak on the behalf of the Father. Uh, anybody who speaks on his own behalf is not a good witness, but whoever speaks on behalf of another is a good witness. Uh, so he goes through this whole business in chapter 7 through 10 about the origin of his activity and that is that he is the manifestation of God's will. Uh, we see this clearly in Hebrews 1, 3. He is the exact manifestation and representation of God himself. Okay, so he's not just simply uh, a, a separate entity, but he is a separate entity that has a purpose in the singular person of God, and then Godhead, Jesus, is the manifestation of the invisible parts of the Godhead. That is, he is the visible manifestation of the mind of God, which is the Father, and the soul of God, which is the Holy Spirit. These are the invisible parts of God. So also, you have the invisible parts of you. Your mind is invisible to others, and your soul is invisible to others. The only way they know what's on your mind is by what you talk, about or what you do. The only way they know what's on your soul is by what you talk about and what you do. Uh, your body is the manifestation of your invisible parts. So also Jesus is the manifestation of the invisible parts of God. And so here uh, the spitting and the putting of his ha hands on the eyes and then the putting of his hands on the eyes a second time uh, this is all out of obedience to God the Father. Uh, this is not a magical formula that you can repeat and do to other people and that if you have enough faith, you can make it do the same thing that Jesus made it do. Jesus didn't do what he did in hopes that God would approve of it. He did what he did as a direct command of God somehow. 
although we don't have that on the list of the scripture, we have it on Jesus' testimony that everything he do he does he does everything that he does is a result of obeying something that God the Father told him to do. Now, God the Father could have told him to do this in prayer, uh, preparing him for the day. You know, Jesus uh, having access to the to the omniscience of God probably knew what was going to happen. Uh, he probably knew that this event was going to take place. All of that is probably there, but we don't have all of that background information. We just simply have the pattern that the Bible sets up that all of this stuff always happens in the background. Okay, so there's there's certain things that are always happening in the background, and that is the Father commanding the Son. That is the Holy Spirit communicating to the Son. That is the, uh, the uh, prayer time that Jesus is, is said that he often withdrew to lonely places to pray. Uh, so we know that there's all this background stuff going on between Jesus and the Father. It does, it's not always spoken of to the front. To the front, all that we really are seeing is the outcome of the prayer and the communication and the relationship between Christ and uh, Jesus, that is the second person of the Trinity, and the Father, which is the first person of the Trinity. Um, so we really don't have any I any reason to believe that anything is going on here other than obedience. Now, that's that's probably why the, the spit and the Sabbath, if that is even a part of the NIV rendering, why a two-stage healing? Now, that's different. That is really different. Jesus doesn't usually heal in two stages. Uh, usually he heals in one stage. Touch, healed. Uh, you know, be opened and it's opened. Uh, you know, rise, take your bed and walk. And they rise, they take their bed and walk. There's usually not two stages in healing. Um, and so we say, well, why a two-stage healing? Because this is a curiosity. Um, we don't know. <laughs> Again, we just don't know. There's not enough scripture. Now, I, I have, I've heard some fellows that have said that this man was being somehow held up as an example of, of the need for both justification and sanctification. I, I don't believe that we have enough scripture to substantiate that. Uh, I, it's an interesting speculation, but I don't think we have enough scripture to, uh, to, to establish that as, as being the reason. Um, the, uh, the fact that, that uh, Jesus took this man out of the town, led him out of the town, to work on him indicates that there was something that was going on here that Jesus did not want it to be uh, just a popular healing. There were plenty of popular healings that went on. Of course, in the feeding of the 4,000, which we talked about just a little bit ago, there was a lot of popular healing. Now, what do I mean by popular healing? I mean, it was healings that were done in front of a lot of people so that they could see it and witness it and such. But in this particular case, he took him outside where he wanted it to be, you know, private. And then not only that, but after the healing was over, he said to the man, don't, don't go back into the town. Don't talk to other people. Just go to your own house and uh, let this be between you and the Lord. So it could be that this, uh, that this is a, uh, somewhat of a testimony with regards to salvation. Uh, it could be a, an historic testimony of some kind, a uh, testimony about uh, old Israel that saw, that, that saw things uh, like Paul says in uh, 1 Corinthians 13, that it sees things through a glass darkly, but then later they will uh, know even as they are fully known, for they'll see God face to face. 
it could be that that this is what is being said uh, in some fashion through here that uh, the old kingdom only saw things as if they were looking through a glass darkly and uh, now uh, in the future they're going to see things more clearly uh, when when we have had our eyes uh, opened and our ears opened um, fully and uh, so the it, I would say that if it's if it means anything at all it probably means the second one that uh, that it's this because there's other scripture that would explain this particular miracle which would be the scripture in first Corinthians 13. So I would say that that's more likely the possibility rather than this being a, some kind of a testimony about a two-stage uh, salvation that includes uh, both justification and sanctification. Um, it would seem that it's more likely uh, he, sees tree, he sees men as trees walking around kind of like looking through a glass darkly or a smoky glass as one of the translations says. And uh, then uh, we will know, even as we are fully known, for we will see him face to face in the second stage of the healing. Now he's got his eyes wide open. He can see and he knows even as he is fully known. So I'm guessing that what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 13 explains what Jesus was trying to say uh, through this unique and unusual two-stage healing uh, since he took this man away from the populace, uh, there must have been something specific he was trying to say through what he did, especially since uh, he told the man not to tell anybody what had happened. And so that's kind of where we are right now. I think we're going to just go ahead and stop there. Uh, I will, like I say, I will post this uh, study guide online, and you'll be able to see 1A and B, which we just studied. And uh, we'll be talking about Peter's confession of faith in Matthew 16 as we get on to uh, question number two uh, next week. So, uh, in the meantime, let's have a word of prayer. Merciful Father, your hand is upon us. Guide us and direct us, Lord. Uh, we would guide and direct ourselves, Father, but uh, without you we are blind. Without you we are deaf. Without you, Lord, we're dumb. We need you, Lord. Without you, there is nothing. There is just emptiness and void. For the scripture said that we must remain in Christ and Christ in us. For apart from him, we can do nothing. And therefore, Lord, we don't rely on our invention and our understanding but we rely upon you and upon you wholly. Be with us, Lord, I ask, as we part one from the other, and be with us, Lord, through the week, that uh, we might be able to finish this week well, me and uh, that we would meet together, Lord, at the time of the uh, church service on Sunday, whether virtually or whether in person, and uh, that your hand would continue to move. We thank you for everyone watching and everyone that will be watching. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for participating tonight. We will see you again uh, online or in person later. Okay.